Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the question, Anya, and thank you uh, to the Global Logistics Cluster for inviting me to join this uh, this panel. So indeed, um, with CORT, uh, with the KLU team, uh, we've uh, conducted uh, three LCA projects over the, over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, but before I share some of our main findings, I, uh, I just wanted to briefly explain what is uh, an LCA for people that are uh, not familiar yet with, uh, with the concept. So LCA stands for Life Cycle Assessment. It is uh, a method methodology that enables you to measure the environmental footprints of a product, uh, usually over its uh, entire, life, uh, entire life cycle. So including uh, things like uh, raw material extraction, uh, manufacturing, uh, transportation, storage, the use of the product and, uh, and its uh, disposal. And so you measure the environmental footprint of the product, uh, also considering different uh, environmental, environmental dimensions. So you can consider carbon emissions and global warming, but you can also consider things like uh, soil degradation or uh, water pollution. So LCS uh, usually uh, come with a very broad scope, which is what makes them uh, such what, what, what makes it such a powerful uh, methodology. Um, and so at court, we indeed uh, conducted uh, three LCS uh, projects. Uh, so the first one uh, was um, focusing on um, a fortified food product. Uh, the second one was looking at a medical kit, and that was together with uh, UNFP, I'm seeing uh, Dennis here as well. Uh, and the third one, um, we considered uh, an electrical uh, vehicle and um, a traditional car, um, specifically in, um, in developing countries uh, where humanitarian organizations um, operates. Uh, so Anya, you're asking about the, the main findings, so I'll just share uh, three of them. Uh, so the first one is that um, the, the production of, um, of the items, uh, that typically represents the, um, the largest um, the, the main contributor, um, it's, it's the main contributor to the environmental footprint of a, of a product. And I'm thinking here uh, specifically about the, the fortified food product and the medical kits that we um, that we analyzed. So just to illustrate that with, uh, with some number, if we look at the fortified food product that we analyzed, and if I can just uh, consider carbon emissions here, the agricultural production um, and the processing of the item, uh, together that summed up to uh, more than 60% of the carbon footprint of the product. Um, so what that means in short is that uh, green procurement matters and that's why we are all here uh, today. Uh, so the second finding that I'd like to share is about the disposal uh, process. So the disposal of uh, packaging materials, uh, the disposal of the item itself uh, and any sort of waste. Um, so again, here, considering the, the fortified food products and, and the medical kit uh, studies that we did. Uh, so also that disposal process is not non, uh, neglectable uh, to give you uh, yet another number uh, focusing on carbon emissions. Uh, for the fortified food products, we were at around uh, 10%. Um, so just for the dis disposal. 10% uh, of the entire um, uh, carbon footprint of the of the product. Uh, so what that means is that um, waste waste really matters not just from a waste disposal point of view, but also uh, considering um, um, yeah uh, carbon emissions. Um, and so uh, it's important, I think you guys know it, but it's important to, to take that in consideration when you uh, design a, a product and when you look at uh, item specifications. And the, the third finding um, that I'd like to share is about the fact that LCAs um, make it possible to look at different environmental dimensions at once. So you can consider global warming, but you can also look at, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that you can look at soil degradation and other environmental challenges. And if you are comparing um, products or scenarios with each other, uh, you might be in a situation that uh, one uh, product or scenario scores very well uh, with regards to one environmental dimension, but not so well with regards to another one uh, in comparison with another uh, product or scenario. So it might be a bit difficult to conclude on that and um, definitely some trade-offs will be involved in, uh, in the process. Um, so I think while it might not be possible to fully overcome uh, that complexity, I think being aware is a really a good uh, first step in, in the right direction. And uh, to answer to the second part of your question, Anya, um, about how LCS can drive uh, innovation in uh, procurement and sourcing, well, LCS is really just about creating that uh, environmental um, visibility, so understanding what are the environmental issues with regard to one product and what are the, the heaviest uh, life cycle steps. And I think uh, that visibility is, is a prerequisite um, to eco-friendly uh, innovation.
Thank you very much. It perhaps won't come as a surprise that the production is uh, the biggest culprit in uh, carbon emissions and 60 percent, I think you said. Yeah. And um, it's also interesting to hear about the sort of trade off needed when you come to designing a new product and the specification. So what do you think you really need to bear in mind? What's the most important thing when you're actually setting a new specification? Well, I mean, I might repeat myself here, but the first step is really to create um, that visibility. And um, uh, LC is, is obviously one of the most powerful methodologies to do that, but obviously I'm very aware uh, that LCAs um, are time consuming, uh, data intensive, and it, it might require expertise that organizations don't have in-house. I'm a little but slow. Can't hear you anymore. Your major step here, um, you will have to conduct some research to to know uh, what uh, what you can possibly ask to your vendors where the industry stands. And uh, and while you might not need uh, an environmental scientist in house to to conduct that uh, the research. You would still need to have some some industry knowledge. So I think if I can refer to the REC project here, uh, one of the objectives of the REC was to have one um, environmental uh, specialist at board. I don't know if that person was already hired, but I think if humanitarian organization have the the possibility to tap into that um, into that knowledge, um, that, that that would be great. Uh, and the last point that I'd like to mention is a bit of a reminder. So sustainability is a three-dimensional uh, concept. Um, so we're talking right now about environmental sustainability, uh, but you also have uh, economic and social sustainability. Um, and these dimensions cannot be dissociated from each other. Uh, you have to um, consider them jointly. So I think in the exercise of the item specification that further complexifies that that exercise but it's important to keep that uh, that uh, triple bottom line uh, framework in mind thank you very much uh, sophie and um just to say those of you watching online i think one of you was trying to say you can't hear well we're trying to source it at the moment thank you very much um thank you so much sophie so um carmen i'd like to bring you in here so ICRC has been working on the design of relief items, um, looking at the life cycle of products and adopting a quality, social and environmental QSE approach to ensure that sustainable development is a goal to be achieved by balancing. And again, it's, it's interesting, this idea of balance, really, in, in all of this, balancing the three pillars of sustainability, quality and society. Um, for externally provided processes. So tell us a little bit about the process that you uh, took to review the ICRC's item specifications. Thank you, Anya. Um, can I answer showing a couple of slides? So uh, I think it will summarize a bit better what I want uh, I want to say. So in ICRC, we have, uh, well, it's not ICRC, it's the Sustainable Supply Chain Alliance that we are doing also with uh, with the Federation. And we have also worked with the UNHCR. So sorry if I said ICRC, <laughs> I didn't mean it. Okay, so we start working uh, on the non-food non items and we did a revision of the specifications. The specifications are not new. We are using the old specifications that we had. And we look at not only about the CO2 emissions that, um, that she was talking about, that, um, uh, Sophie was talking about, but we were looking at the, as she said, at the three, uh, the three, uh, the environment, the social, and the economic, which for us is much more related to quality. So what they did, we agree on a sustainable criteria, and we went through all these items. We went through this sustainable criteria to see what was already happening, what was already being done, and what was missing. So we didn't go too much into the details of the specific items, as we didn't do the life cycle analysis, but we wanted to understand. First, what was already being done, because many things were already there and we didn't even know, okay? And things that were missing. We bring that information and those questions to the suppliers, because I think it's key to, to, to really work with the suppliers and to understand what is feasible from their side. We came with these questions with the suppliers. Some of them were answered. Some of them, they said, you can do that. And some of them, they were not answered. Or we actually got different information from different suppliers. 
So we said, okay, this we cannot take it. We need to do a, a more deeper research. So at the end, we have like um, we were able to identify from these uh, main uh, items which one are completely clean, at least under today's view, like the kitchen set and some others, which one we did need to do really a proper research. And also which one actually we need to do a pilot because sometimes we, we cannot just change an item. The ones we are not using those items, the, the ones who is using those items are the beneficiaries. So we need to ask them. So for example, we have the solid shampoo. We use we used to share uh, liquid shampoo in some places in um, in uh, Middle East. And then we wanted to change it for lock of solid shampoo, but it's not that quick. You know, we tried the pilot, the, the, actually the, the, the ministry didn't let us in. So you need to, to really look into that. And what it was really interesting was that when we start the conversation with one of some of the suppliers, when we come and say, look, uh, can we change this, this and this? They actually came with even more. So they said, ah, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's us think. And then two weeks after they came, not only with the three requests that we asked, they came with 10. And they said, do you, do you think this is interesting? Do you think that's interesting? So that's why this conversation is really important for anywhere, anywhere, you know, to have the conversation. That was, um, you know, what we did on general. And this, as I mentioned there, the beginning of a long journey because things are changing. So, and if I can go to the next slide, please, I will go to a concrete example. And this is what we are doing with the Eco Design Tarpaulin, where we did, um, uh, I mean, we did a survey with, with beneficiaries, because as I said, we need to understand what for the beneficiaries is already good from the item that we already have and try not to change that because maybe being sustainable is not just the, the final uh, uh, focus and then we did different uh, data research so we did a uv test for 10 years to understand how the tarpaulin was actually acting um, yeah, under the sun like in the desert for 10 years we did a market analysis where we we look with the research institute of sweden uh other uh tarpaulins that the commercial world is using so for example they came with a tarpaulin that is used in the co a construction sites but the people that they jump you know they jump so if there is an accident and they <laughs> they go uh, out of uh, of the building, so you know there is always a tarpaulin. So they came with these kind of examples to actually see what was good on that, and then we look at for what we use the tarpaulin. And with that, with all that information, we did a life cycle analysis in the current tarpaulin. We did a life cycle analysis as she was explaining about the alternative materials because it was clear that we can know. You know, when I started, I thought that we could create this green tarpaulin, and at the end, that was, not, that was not feasible. We need to use PE, and that was one of the research, what, one of the conclusion from the research institute. So we did a life cycle analysis for virgin recycle and bioplastic bio, uh, to also understand what is good for each of them and try to, to get the final results. With this, we kind of look in, we did the lab test for six of the tarpaulins, and then we, we, um, we came with very specific, specifications that the suppliers were able to match because we say we want this and we ask them can you build it can you make it and then they came with different options and they say yes we can build this but not that and then we started with the discussion it was with six five suppliers today we have that the lab test we have that uh the health quarters uh, test and we're doing the field test uh that i hope it will go well and if that field test is working well then we will be able to have a tarpaulin that will uh will have a 16 reduction of plastic, okay? So it's not perfect, but at least we use plastic, but at least we, we reduce the plastic that will, we will have at the end. We will have 15, and the transport as well, we have 15% recycle. If it's a good high quality recycled plastic, because that's the difference between post-consumer plastic and industrial. Many people say, ah, recycled plastic, but that is industrial, which is not exactly the same, you know, because this is already there. So the post-consumer post is the one that is always most, most, uh, more complicated. We hope we will be able to have 15% and we will be able to duplicate or twice extended lifespan because we are increasing the cut resistance, we are increasing the, the tensile, so many different things. Yeah, that, 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 that is interesting. And um, it's interesting to hear about the two-way conversation and that you must listen to suppliers. That's a good piece of advice. Um, I suppose the question that comes to mind is what about cost? Is this going to be much more expensive? Actually, today is 5% less expensive, okay. but because it's less plastic, but for me, we'll see once it's finalized the product <laughs> and the field test, because, you know, we're also looking at the fasting, um, fasting uh, system. So it may be, you know, I don't know, but today is 5% less, which is already good because we will have also to pay less for the transport because, you know, tarpaulins are quite heavy and volume. So yes, so in this specific case, I'm not saying everywhere is the same. 
Okay, we've got about a minute left between you and me, so I am just need you to answer this very briefly, and it's quite a complicated question. So should agreements be made with suppliers so their products are created to comply directly with the criteria list instead of verifying the product complies with the criteria? I will make a, a point here just by a simple answer. When all of you, you are in Geneva, you took the bus, right? And you pay the ticket. You pay the ticket, some of you, because you know that you have to pay it, Sometimes because you know that they will come, you know, a police will enter and then you will have to pay a fine if you were not in with, with your ticket, right? So there is a percentage of people that will pay, will pay just because a police will come and see. If we don't check, actually, there is a percentage that we will receive bad quality. And this is real everywhere. I'm not saying we have to trust our suppliers, that's for sure. We need to trust them, but we need, and we, but we need to make sure that when we ask specifications, we know what we are looking for because otherwise they can send you anything. Okay, thank that, was brief. that was brief. Thank <laughs> you, and it was a good example, good analogy. Thank you, um, Ignacio. I'd like to bring you in here. So um, we've been hearing about uh, the supply chain and how important the beginning of the supply chain is. So when an aid item has been purchased, distributed, and used by beneficiaries, there's little to be done to deal with the waste. Um, so it makes sense to try to integrate sustainability at the start of the supply chain. Um, can you talk us through the process that's led you to change the packaging specifications, for instance, uh, of UNHCR's core relief items? Absolutely. It uh, was born here last year. I think we can show if I have also one uh, couple of slides, but this process started last year. And uh, we were here to sign, uh, to, to discuss about uh, the, the chart that we had uh, all signed. And uh, we realized that many things we are doing together with uh, exactly what uh, other agencies are doing, what ICRs are doing. Uh, next, please. If uh, uh, we were concentrating on what to do, and this is actually what we have done. We have mainly focused on the, on the uh, core relief items that UNHCR distributes. While doing this, and we, this is the new, this is the process that we had done in one year. So we are there with uh, with 100% blankets. So we are there with uh, with uh, solar lanterns that are mainly made of uh, recycled plastic. There are many many things that that we have done. But what Nabody has done in my organization was to look at the at the actual uh, packaging, and that was uh, everybody was uh, was. Was telling it's time to do it. There was the joint initiative. There were uh, the the rec. We were all there, and we said, "Why we don't talk and we do it?" So what we have done is just we have taken out the single plastic from any packaging. We have moved out the uh, virgin uh, uh, packaging into recycled pla packaging or juta packaging or whatever. We have uh, maybe you can show the next uh, the next one. I don't know if it's there. We have also focused uh, to uh, to the uh, boxes and what we had. We had beautiful white boxes in it here with fantastic uh, blue coating uh, and fantastic that that we were all proud of that. <laughs> Since we realized that that means seventy percent more CO two. Why we had to get white boxes when we can have uh, recycled cardboard and. Uh, save on CO2. So we pass, we managed to pass this message. So when uh, when you ask me uh, what you have to do, they, I think the, 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 cake, the, the cake is in the cake, okay? It's just uh, starting doing it and, uh, and realizing that this uh, is definitely possible. Right, so I mean, so we've heard about how important suppliers are with some of the other presentations. So what kind of response did you have from them? And um, what would you, what advice would you give to the other agencies here to get them started? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Carmen knows that they always refer to us as an industry and uh, the suppliers as another industry, but uh, we grow together. And uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting to see in the moment when we start talking about the objective of UNHCR, which is reducing 20% of the plastic by 25, the suppliers had already done. They were ready because they were there doing for another UN agency. They were doing for the market. They were there. So it was a pretty what they were, they were waiting for. Simply, we were not telling them. I give you an example, which I have in my hands. You asked me to bring one example. This box last year 
was double volume, was not uh, this color, was again, nice, uh, nice. Uh, and uh, it had a lot of plastic inside. Now you have a recycled cloth. You have uh, no, as you see, there is no plastic. The paper is here, the instruction are there. And uh, the magic thing is that all of this is made of 100% recycled plastic. This is not recyclable yet. By 25, it will be. The issue is what I, what I mean is that we, we didn't, uh, we told them to reduce the plastic. They came with reduced volume. They even came with, uh, with a proposal with no blue, with no colors, but we realized that the, the impact in terms of plastic is this box is different. Plastic in color is different. So definitely we need to talk, we need to talk together. And we need to give the example that we do it uh, today, not by 25. Okay, so um, removing single use plastics, one answer is to use recycled plastics, but perhaps it's not quite what you want to achieve in the end, it's just to get rid of, um, you need to be able to recycle that plastic again. What do you think are the key enabling factors to help you do that sort of agencies what what do they need to think about in order to achieve that okay the first thing is that is a must and they go back to the to the to the chart we have signed the chart we are committed to do that so we do it for our people of concern we do it for the planet we do for everybody so there is a moral must there is a fact that uh, refugees are and the other people of concern they are asking us to do it we had uh, as everybody we ask we don't uh, simply do it. We had, uh, we had a couple of uh, of uh, um, of uh, example uh, from feedback from uh, from the people from the, the people we serve, and definitely they are asking they are asking for this. So it's something that uh, they will be the one that will have to collect tomorrow. So we need to start to make items that uh, are collectible. And we need to, to talk to the end user like the, the companies talk to us as a consumer. Here you have a nice, you have everything, all the information about the product, how to recycle, how to use it next. Same, we have introduced the, the labels. So we say what the material is made of, how can you recycle, if it's recycled, and how valuable is all of that. So it's changing the... The, the word I didn't use, but I, I have uh, always on my lip is the culture. It's a matter of culture. It's a greening culture that the humanitarians were looking at, and I come back to the question you made to, to her, because we were all thinking, oh, environmental issues are so expensive out there. You know how much is the blanket that we, have ju we are just buying for, uh, where, in Syria? How much more expensive is a 100% recycled blanket than a virgin one? Zero, minus 2% actually. And in the moment when we said that we are going toward 100% to go back to the suppliers, they were all tell, oh, it's 50% more expensive, whatever. And then we went to the uh, different uh, index of recycled plastic. And the index tells you, that is uh, the raw material of recycled plastics less than percent now. So what we want is also that the industry change, that uh, the product, we all want that the production of uh, plastic is made out of recycled plastic and not virgin plastic because it means less oil extracted, means less CO2, means less anything that we are talking about. So culture and uh, moving together. I will never repeat stop to saying that we move together, we count together, we, <laughs> we list together, we have items together. Thank you. Thank you very much and really encouraging there. So um, I'm just gonna come to our last speaker, Nadia from UNHRD. So reducing lead times and waste generation at each step of a supply chain is key to uh, avoid loss losses and reduce environmental impacts. And warehousing is at the core of all of this, of this supply processes. Um, can you describe some of the initiatives that are being rolled out by UNHRD in 2023? 
Yes, thank you very much. And I will be quite brief because I do want to leave quite a bit of time for questions. So as UNHRD, I mean, I think we took the position where, you know, and this is exactly what, what my colleague was just describing is we have to start somewhere. We have to, to move, we have to take action in, in, in some form. And so what we've started is, um, I think, quite an ambitious project is to, to green our warehouses. So these are, we have a global network of five hubs and we have taken it upon ourselves to try to make these as sustainable as possible. Um, obviously, these, these warehouses are very valuable facilities. They are given to us by our host governments free of charge. Um, globally, they represent about $10.5 million of savings for the humanitarian community a year in terms of the free storage um, that, 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 they, that they provide. And so what we have started is with an assessment of our hub in Accra, which already has some, uh, some form of, of renewable energy installed in, in the warehouse, but we're taking it a lot further. Um, and our goal is to, to achieve uh, net zero carbon warehouses, starting with Accra and then moving on to our other locations. And again, these, these, uh, these warehouses are there for the use of the entire humanitarian community. And so they will offset all of our emissions in some form. Right, so that, that, that's good to know everyone. There's uh, five hubs available for, for use there. So when you're trying to green storage, um, here's another question, which is a bit of a conundrum again, uh, one of these trade-off potential questions. Is it best to try and forecast as accurately as possible um, and risk having to ship uh, by plane potentially goods which um, when an emergency arises, or is it better to have a buffer and have those goods there already but then risk having a surplus. I mean, I think the last few years have also taught us the the value of uh, of stockpiling um, essential items, and this is and this is not it's not strictly related to the the conversation of sustainability, but obviously that does that does benefit as well. I think what we realize as the humanitarian community from the COVID response and then also from the Ukraine response is that it is better to have a buffer of stocks. Obviously, if we can ship more items by sea with uh, longer lead times, we will reduce our, our um, carbon footprint overall as well. So of course it is beneficial and we do prefer to have a buffer of stocks. Okay, thank you for being, and thank you for being so brief. So we have a little bit of extra time for questions. So I hope you guys have some questions. Um, do raise your hand. You need to, um, when I call you, press the microphone in front of you. So does anyone here have a question? Uh, those watching online, do send your questions in to Zoom. I do have one already from online, but is there anyone in the room who wants to ask a question? Yeah. Okay, so Danny, and then Danny, do you want to go first and then yourself? Thanks. Uh, of, course I, of course, I have questions. <laughs> um, so three brief ones. One being, um, Sophie, you mentioned that the manufacturing step is the biggest contributor. And of course, we saw this in the study that we did with you as well. And especially for medicines, it's a huge contributor. Um, the question being then is how do we then as a community link that to rational procurement choices? Because then you can't avoid that step. There's nothing we can do to mitigate it. The only thing you can do to mitigate it is have more accurate and demand-driven supply planning, uh, which is linked to preparedness and forecasting. So how do we link these two conversations together? The second being that um, one of the things, the, you know, linking it back to the procurement piece is something that we've been trying to work on. And I think, I know many agencies have been trying to work on, which is this best value for money definition that we use in procurement, right? Where it's quality and price for so long were the main indicating factors for what led to a procurement contract. And now I think we're trying to quantify, okay, what is that green criteria that we can include in that and how much more, yes, it might not always be more expensive, but in the case that it is, what is that quantifiable cost variable that we could use where we're willing to pay one dollar more for a product that has met these standards versus this other product and how do we do that as a community and the last one is um i think the work that's being done by both icrc and unhcr is great we've we've had some brief conversations with unhcr about some of overlapping products in the past but i think for smaller agencies and unfpa we're not small but compared to many ngos but we're still not as maybe large as a wfp or unhcr and icrc the ability to invest in those kinds of research pieces is a lot different, both from staff time and financial resources. So is there a way, kind of like what we've done in the menstrual hygiene supply sector, where we've been able to kind of do more open source specifications, right, where a spec that's been developed and researched, which is more green, can then be tapped into by other humanitarian actors who can essentially copy and paste that spec that they then are using for their own procurement purposes. 
Thanks. Okay, so who'd like to take the, the question about um, being able to share the findings of your research? I mean, that should be available somewhere. The last one, the last one, is, oh, sorry, of your audio. <laughs> Now maybe I'll take uh, Danny's first question. Um, I think essentially what what you're asking is how to how to make sure that we only procure what we need and, and nothing more because uh, you know items comes with uh, come with such a big um, a big footprint. Uh, and a short answer to that is supply chain planning. So you know the people who know me know that I'm very passionate about the topic of supply chain planning and uh, and I've been uh, doing research on on that for for a few months now. And I think there's um, there's still a big learning curve for for the sector to improve on. Uh, on supply chain planning, uh, which is very exciting somehow. And uh, and if, if I consider you in it here, I think you guys have a, a wonderful environmental strategy where supply chain planning is, is really one of the, uh, actually it's part of two of the five uh, pillars of the environmental um, a strategy. So I think including supply chain planning and, and really su a supply chain approach um, in, into environmental strategies is is a key uh, is a key point. But there's still there's still a curve, definitely. But it's a it's an important point that you're bringing up. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, and Ignacio, you were going to come in with a question mm -hmm. about no. I thought you were going directly to the question three. Well, who's going to answer question two? What well, was question two? About the, the oh yeah, best value for money. Everyone is looking at me, <laughs> and actually, I don't think I, I don't think I have the right answer to that because, for example, in ICRC, we have been trying to put sustainability on our selection table, and we are able to do it with a quality social environmental assessment, but we are not going able to do it with anything else because it's such a high and and huge a holistic approach that if you want to do it right, at least us, we didn't find solutions. I know others have done it, and I'm very uh, proud of that because you know I know. Um, uh, save the children, they manage away. MSF also manage away. But for us, looking at how the structure and how we work, we didn't manage. And that's that's actually the key. And I think uh, it was um, um, Nadia who was saying it. Uh, we are just at the beginning of the process. And we need to continue working together to make it happen. We need to learn from each other. Otherwise, we will never reach what we are, those targets that the charter where we all signed. We will never reach it. So that's that's why I don't think I'm the right one to answer that one. But there is there is organizations that they have managed, you know. So it's just to start asking, getting, and see what it works for your organization. And I hope that the REC project, I mean, is already making this uh, exchange of experience so that others can actually uh, learn and see how it works for them, you know. Okay. I mean, I could I could take a shot on this, even though I wasn't really speaking to this this part of the of the discussion. Um, and this is this comes from a bit of my procurement background in the past. Um, I mean, essentially, and this this again, it depends on each agency and obviously the the rules of procurement and and what those allow us to do. But often, I have seen that we do try to give a few more points, let's say, for when we do see suppliers um, proposing something that is better or for example we have uh, in w in wfp we have these prefabricated structures you know the the offices that we set up when there are when there there is an emergency and one of the things we did ask suppliers to do and we asked them to work and we did put in our in our rfp document was you know to to propose solutions that would completely eliminate the 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 plastic packaging um, and and so that is part of the but that that then has to be integrated into the actual evaluation of the proposals um, and so that that is one approach to it. Um, it's a starting point. Just just one to complement because this is actually the point. Then you go back to the specifications. So it's not the selection table. You pay one. You go with the specification saying that's what I want. So that's exactly the point. For example, now what we are trying, we don't know if we will make it, is to focus on the main EHIs to see if the suppliers they have solar solar um, energy they use. But then making sure that we check, you know, because otherwise it will end up. On people saying we have, we have, and what is behind? And that's why the, that's the that's the problem that we have. Thank you. Okay. Best value. May I? Sure. Best value and open source. Okay. I think that the big needs to help the the small here, because the aim is exactly the same. So. Whatever we have invested, whatever we are look, it's in the uh, Red Cross. Uh, uh, how do you call it? I always forget it. Uh, the, in the, the uh, catalog. In the catalog, there is the calculator, and the calculator is uh, is growing up. We are also now giving our inputs on that. There are the specification of units that are all open. 
So all of this, th th there is a, an investment. So there are some who have taken this moment and they, and they said, now we do it. Let's take advantage of this moment because this will not repeat. So whatever we build up now needs to be absolutely open source, needs to be publicized, needs to be well shared with the suppliers and also with the new suppliers who can now enter because we are opening a new market. The second point you were saying, and now I forgot, it was the about was the uh, supply no the, and the supply chain, the link to the supply chain, on the planning. When we started doing this, we were only interested the two. The little picture because we said that they are, uh, it's uh, we are all carbon neutral. Ha <laughs> ha! What the joke? We are all carbon neutral. So let's see how we are really carbon neutral. What make carbon neutral? So that change completed the perspective. So being able to have a look on different pillars of what we are doing and going back up, down the streams of the production and to see if even our, our suppliers are carbon neutral, if even our personal concern are carbon neutral, if we can really talk, think a bit more circular than absolutely straight toward the, 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 the precipice, it's uh, it makes sense or not. So I, I think that it's again is a is a huge uh, uh, is is a huge change in perspective and and is an investment at the same time for all of us. Thank you. And just a comment that's come in on on this subject: a pH we add up to ten percent in the quality points to the sustainable solutions. Um, so that's ten percent of fifty percent. Sorry, I'm not wearing my glasses. So I'm not doing well <laughs> in total for quality. Yeah, so that there's a point there. Um, okay, there was a question here. Yes, hi, it's for Sophie actually. Uh, just a quick question because um, you mentioned that 60% of the carbon footprint of an item is uh, linked to its production. And I think maybe we tend as a sector to focus a lot on carbon uh, and not think about the other environmental impacts. And I was wondering if you could put that in perspective of the general environmental footprint of how much is production in the environment in the environmental footprint of an item in general yeah that's uh that's a complex question question so actually i was i was indeed commenting on the 60 percent with carbon emissions because carbon emission is is is, is very it's easy to quantify and, and, and there is a big focus on on climate change but if you start considering the other environmental dimensions then actually for um for that specific lc that we did we considered 15 in total so if you have to start quantifying everything it's a very big uh, it's a complex exercise to share the results um, so um, I think here it's very um, product specific that for each product you should look at what are the main environmental challenges for that product specifically and focus on these. So that's indeed, um, if you talk about agriculture, it goes beyond uh, carbon. It's also about soil degradation, which is a very important uh, um, a challenge. So I think for each product, you should look at the different uh, dimensions that make sense for that product specifically. Um, but but indeed, I mean, it is you have to take a holistic uh, approach here. I still think that a complexity is, is if you look at everything at once, that you are totally uh, frozen in the process and you don't know how to, how, you know, what to focus on anymore. Um, so yeah, there, there's no easy answer to that, but I think it will really depend from, from one uh, product to, uh, to another on how you prioritize, what you prioritize really. Can I add? Uh, uh, yeah, so just that. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm Samantha from the Joint Initiative. Um, sorry, I lost what I was gonna say. Oh yeah, about <laughs> LCAs, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a, at all a specialist in this, but uh, I'm not entirely convinced that the sector is, uh, that it's a tool adapted to the sector. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, so I think, um, I mean, I think the sector shouldn't strive to do LCS for every single items uh, that the sector is distributing because there is so many. Uh, if you consider the, the product catalog of ICRC, it's it's huge. So I think what would make sense is to really focus on those flagship items that are, you know, the core relief items like you and Sharon is doing that are really um, important for the sector. At least start with these and for the rest, um, the other items maybe do more like secondary research indeed. So rely on other industries that are focusing more on, on, on this. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that would be my... Yeah, but then it depends where you buy it. That's why I don't understand. Like the LCA of a product you buy in Belgium is different from the... 
Yeah. So, I mean, I, I understand making that information available for everyone, but how can it be used? So it's an honest question. Yeah. Right? And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on where you buy it. Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, do I think maybe um, not, I mean, um, you will find similarities no matter where you buy it. I think big uh, answer to your question will be common across different uh, uh, sources of um, sources of supply. Um, and I, I lost my other thoughts. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it to that. I think, um, yeah. I think there's still a case. Um, and okay, no, what I was going to say is um, I think, you know, really looking at the future in, in five or 10 years, uh, which we should strive for is not doing some um, ad hoc uh, LCAs because also the world is changing every day. So your LCA might be outdated uh, within the time of three months. Uh, but what we should strive for is to, to have more data, data available and exchange directly uh, from the suppliers. But obviously here, if you're looking at local suppliers, they might not always have that uh, maturity yet. So it, it's also about working with them on building that, uh, um, on helping them climb, climbing the sustainability, uh, sustainability, sustainability ladder. Yeah. And, and if I can complement, that's why it's important when we do LCS to focus in main items that we more or less know where they came from, more or less about the specifications, because otherwise you will never end, as you just said. So it's it's uh, really key because when, they, when we did the life, sec, uh, life second analysis and we did also for something for Flip, um, it gives you general information. It doesn't go into all the details because at the end you don't have all the data. And we were when we were asking the suppliers, mm -hmm. we didn't get all the data because sometimes they don't want to share it. So the LCS, they always have some, some. Um, I, I don't know how to say it. Some, um, yeah, it's not accurate. It's, it's not stage. hundred yeah. exactly. It's not hundred percent accurate either. They give you some some yeah. information. That's why it's important. But it's not the only thing, you know. And CO two is not the only thing. There are many other things. Yeah. That's the, that's the issue of the sustainability and what we do. Uh, and they need to be also by balanced with uh, with the other information with global data that you have with the specific data about the country which in terms of production of energy in terms of social economic and and that and that are and that, those are those fact those all factors uh, we will come we are, we already did it internally but i think we will uh, we will put also that available externally our uh, uh, calculator we are, we are using, we have a sustainability approach to that, that consider all, all these things from the distance of the, of the plastic uh, yarn uh, to the, to the factory, from the use of, uh, of uh, energy of the factory, the use of water of the factory, the use of, uh, uh, I mean, all of the, all those things, we, we have listed them. I think those are, are some, the issue is how you balance that. So it will depend very much on, on your, your vision and more social, uh, agency will look at that dimension integration uh, i only think of uh, of uh, of uh, any a medical versus uh, a, a technical i mean it change a lot so um we can i just come in with a couple of questions that have come in online and if anyone else wants to ask put your hand up so i can know how much uh, longer we've got to take some okay so there's one one up there um, so uh, I just wanted to ask, there's a specific question to you, Carmen. Um, can you let us know the five suppliers who responded to the environmental tarpaulin request? Are you able to do that? No, I didn't think you would. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, and then here's another one, which is uh, one for maybe Nadia or Ignacio or Carmen. Um, how do you recycle recyclable products in countries which don't have any recycling? Who Can I say that one? Okay. Because, for example, with the tarpaulin project, and I forgot to mention, you saw the pictures, okay? Um, we came with a solution that I hope that it will be implemented somewhere that is by using, you know, a tarpaulin, okay, a, a tarpaulin that is already broken so that it can, be, it can be recycled, you know? Then you put plastic in the middle and and I don't know if you can show the pictures uh, from the from the slides so people will understand it uh, better. Then you can actually make uh, this corrugated roof sheet. You know, can you see it there? Okay. So you put two tarpaulins that they're already broken, so it doesn't matter. So and then you put all the plastic in the middle, and then you can uh, you can have correlated uh, roof sheet that is made of plastic that can last ten years, and that it can be recycled again and again and again. And this is things that, for example, in a refugee camp could work. 
in the way that ICRC work doesn't work with the way uh, we do it. And it will be great that we start, you know, there are many options. I, I mean, many um, are things that are already happening. I was going around in HP and W, uh, you know, uh, uh, fair, and there is a lot of things that they are being done, but there's being done very specific in one project somewhere. We need to make it, you know, we meet, need to make it everywhere and to make it standard for all refugee camps. Okay, you have refugee camps, this is, you need to do it for the recycling. This is the next that you need to do, which is, it's, it's not so easy, but we should get there someday. So that's part of the disseminating so the works. green culture, isn't it? So yeah. just uh, get, getting education out there. Let me actually add something. And, sure. Uh, thank you, Carmen. Actually, it was quite inspiring. Uh, Francesca from the REC project just wanted to share that from our experience, we started seeing that uh, maybe sometimes there's no recycling capacity in a certain country, but uh, it might be possible to actually turn the materials to neighboring countries. So I'm, it's not always the case, but in some cases, uh, like in... Uh, um, in East Africa, we saw that uh, there are some recycling plants in Kenya, which were able to take on material uh, that came from other uh, locations. So I would say, again, it's not always the case, but it's an option. And with the REC, we are trying to map uh, uh, local capacity in terms of uh, waste management and, and recycling infrastructure with the joint initiative as well, at SEM. And uh, we try to make sure to make a, a baseline list available to the whole humanitarian partners. So you can actually uh, try to assess your needs and see if there is capacity uh, somewhere specifically or in a neighboring country. Thank you. Thanks, so, really, really uh, useful there. If I may, um, two things. The first one is uh, our capacity. And our capacity is already there for what uh, concern the warehouse pre and user waste. So whatever is the packaging, whatever is there, needs to be compulsory to collect it, to have it, and to, to, to reuse it first. Like all the pallets, all the boxes, all the things that are in the warehouse, you can't simply think that they go burned into the backyard. But there are many people who still do that, and many organizations who don't think of those. The second one, and I think is much more about this question, is how the post-consumer materials are, are recycled and reused. Uh, the, Refugees and the poorest reuse a lot, much more than we do in our daily life. And you know very well in the, those who are in the field how they are, these are done. But the first step is to collect. And whenever there is, like in, uh, in Kenya, like in other countries, there is a minimal fee, some little money that, that is given, people do it themselves. So when there is an economic incentive that can be done. When there isn't, it needs to become, needs to be incentivated. And we are the one who needs to push for that because what is not recyclable today, it might be recyclable tomorrow. Like with all the e-waste that we started now talking, we are still we still have all the old e-waste to recycle that now has much more value than had it uh, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Thank you very much. So we just got time. We've got about five minutes left. So we'd like to take uh, ask a question and give your name and title, please. Hello, I'm Marie. I'm the head of supply for Solidarity International, and I'm also chair for the interagency procurement group. Uh, I know a couple of faces. Hi. Um, so I have two questions. One is more related to the REC and um, the mention on the open source for the technical specification is really inspiring. I'm aware of the one of the IFRC catalog with the PDF available for you to, to go into. I wasn't aware of the HCR one, and I'm more I'm uh, wondering and not worrying, sorry, uh, about the role of the REC in diffusing that because it's difficult to know that where to find the data uh, as a practitioner, and eventually for the field practitioner, it's even harder. First question, and the second one is um, linked to maybe I don't maybe ICRC unit chair, don't know, but field practitioner. Um, you touch base the uh, environmental criteria and how difficult it is to implement. Trying to push forward in that direction anyway. We're inspired by SAVE and MSF and trying to push forward. How to keep it simple? And how, when you're talking about 30% recycle uh, blanket, for example, do you need to rely all the time on a third party, which means you are already in a middle-income country, uh, middle country, 
or do you think there are things that can be done and innovation in that aspect that can be done? Do you have any thoughts to share on that? Okay, thank you. And I'll just take one more question, which was there, and then we can share the answers between everyone. Hello, my name is Bianca. I work uh, for MSF, and we are also uh, starting a new project to, to focus on, uh, on all of this. So my question is uh, going back to, um, to the challenge of having uh, so many products and uh, figuring out uh, from where to start. So I'm curious to know if uh, the approach is based uh, mainly on uh, the products that we use more often, so on quantities, or do we have um, a, a more uh, precise uh, approach to prioritize the, the items? Okay, so let's start off with REC. Can, what can you do? Can rec? we actually end with REC? Because okay. I can then wrap up. Fine, okay, yeah. good idea. All right. I can start, I can start with, the, with the question of Bianca about the approach to the CRIs. Our approach was very pragmatic. We took the 10 items that are the most polluting. We, took, we calculated their, in, their individual uh, carbon footprint. We multiply for the amount of, uh, of items that, that we, we distribute every year. And uh, we saw those who are the, the heaviest. We also multiply them for the amount of money. So we know exactly how, how much in terms of dollar footprint we have on that. And my suggestion, you start with the bulk, with the difficult, with, the, with what is, uh, is there, because it's also what you can report after more, more easily, because you commit to X and you can stick to X. Then they, we call them waves. Then other waves will, uh, will come. Um, yes. What about, what about the um, simplifying the whole procurement process and cutting out the middleman? Um, I think cutting up the middleman is what we should do mm -hmm. with ICRC, for example, tries, but no, everyone can do that. You know, when you're a small organization, it's not that simple. You know, you go to traders because they're, they're the making feasible for you. If I'm big, then I'm easier to go to manufacturers. So for sure, if you go to manufacturers, it's better for everyone. You know, you can work much more with them. You will get it cheaper, but it's not always simple. But can I go back to um, the, the questions that I had? Because when you were talking about how to make it simple for the people in the field, that's exactly where it gets complicated. And, and I wish, you know, that we have the final solution for sustainable procurement, but it's not that simple. Each country is different. That's why at the end, the complication starts. For us, how we started, and I'm not saying it's the right thing, but at least we, we did, we started to, to train the people to understand what sustainable procurement is. Just for them to rate, I mean, he was talking about the packaging, just to start telling them, look, stop having plastic when you don't need it, change it the way run from the white, like very simple stuff that people can actually easily implement at the local level. We will go back again, if I'm working with a trader, then maybe I am able to change it, but maybe the trader will ask someone to change it because at the end we cost, we reduce costs as well. So that will actually be very, very simple. Packaging, packaging total cost of ownership. I think if the people who is purchasing, but purchasers here, they will understand total cost of ownership. So just bringing this very specific information, then they will make a thing. And what we started doing is that we asked them, guys, start having the conversation with your suppliers. And I can tell you, we, we have a, a person in a month the other day who, who uh, called me and said, look, Carmen, we're having a discussion with a, a company that we have discussions in the past. You have the father who is always the one talking, you know, and trying to sell you the whole thing. And it was the young. And when I asked him, okay, but what are you doing to have your uh, item more sustainable? He goes, a producer, a manufacturer. The, the young got completely excited and said, you know, you see? And then he started giving, you know, examples on how they could actually improve the item, which the father, what, what she told me, I don't know. She said, look, it was quite clear that the father was not listening to his son, you know? And the son saw that we were interested. So he had a point saying, look, you see, we can win money with this. So this is just the, the beginning, I'm, you know, I cannot able to say, look, uh, change this by this, but at least if we start with the conversation, we have it. And then I would try to jump into yours, if I, <laughs> if I can make it, is that we started with the big ones. But then, as you say, there are many others, but maybe they can be even more impactful because, you know, we distribute coal in Ukraine. Imagine distributing coal in Ukraine, you know? And maybe if you look at the numbers and the cost, is not that much, but in terms of risk, it's huge. So what we have done, and I'm sharing it with many of you and the reg in the newsletter, is to start looking at all the items, in looking at volume and criticality, and then see, and this is, as we said, it's just the beginning, you know, then in the long term, we will have it and see what can be done. 
Can we change, we distribute tuna? Why can we change it with sardines, which is better, it's cheaper, you know, like some ideas. So I hope that this, between all of us, we will be able to, to make it a bit more pragmatic, which is what is more complicated today. Thank you. Catherine, would you like to make some brief closing words? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Catherine Ely from the, the REC Project, for those of you who are online. Um, you know, it's great, actually. I love that I, I went right after you, Carmen, because you kind of summed up a lot of it already. And thanks for the question, Marie. Um, the REC Project is, I mean, our, our role really is to compile consolidate and share tools, guidance, expertise, um, trainings, et cetera. So item specifications are already on the REC portal. We've recently got re gone through sort of a revision of how it's laid out so it's easier to search. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know it was not great before. Um, and we're working with a number of different partners to make uh, different trainings available as well. We're, we're already uh, also working on a training uh, module that's going to be an e-learning that's going to be available to colleagues uh, online via the REC, which is going to basically introduce these concepts, right? Um, what is green procurement? What is circular economy? How can we give provide uh, real life examples to field-based practitioner colleagues? Um, our audience really is field-based practitioners and so what we're trying to do level from, from uh, organizations and translate it into something that's really usable for our field-based colleagues but like you said Carmen it's not easy you know and it the way that I look at the topic of environmental sustainability and in humanitarian supply chains it's really a change management process really have to increase the, the level of awareness in you know words that everybody can understand right and I think getting back to basics and being quite simple with the message that we have um is really what we're we're trying to do with the rec project but it's it's you know it's different contexts different language you know, it, there's all kinds of constraints um but it really we rely on partners to share that information with us so that we can therefore share it with everybody else so we do have some information on that we also in terms of green procurement uh we're holding a green procurement sort of coordination meeting where we pull together different um thought leaders and working group leaders uh, on a, every other or so to make sure they're not duplicating efforts and overlapping. We can actually complement each other and use the limited resources that we all have more wisely. So that's what we're trying to do with the REC project. And so I encourage you all to go there. Thank you so much for this discussion. I think it was absolutely fantastic. I apologize again for the IT issues with colleagues online, but we got there in the end. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, all the speakers. It's great to have this shared learning. I mean, this amazing resource of information. I feel we need the whole day to be exchanging all these ideas. Um, so thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to the audience for watching. Thank you, everyone. And I suppose the main takeaway from me is that no single organization can do this alone. So you really need to collaborate. Thank you.